is for you. He is for you. Can you say that even to yourself? God is for me. Oh, praise his name. We have hope in him because he is for us. This morning, as all of you are celebrating Mother's Day, I too celebrate with you. I came from a very long line of women who loved God and were were strong in their faith and very active in the church. And I can't help but thank the Lord for that heritage and that he would give me the privilege now to be the mother of another generation and another generation just like that song. God is for us. Amen. One way I know that is that in this time of shelter in place, I mean, it's been, what, almost two months for a lot of us. And I'm pretty upbeat most of the time. Um, unlike some of my family, I, I don't deal with being discouraged very often. But I have to also say that about, after about a month, this whole stay home, you can't buy your own groceries, can't go pick out your own bananas at the grocery store, started to kind of weigh on me a little bit. Um, A little bit of, maybe a little bit of heaviness for me. And I, I began to just feel like the energy out of, went to a a lower place for me. A little bit more of the, just the the passion for living and the passion for, it just was a little lower than normal. And I I began to feel that. I began to identify that in myself and thought, Lord, I I mean, this thing's not going to be over for a little while. I can't just kind of stay under this or let it even grow. And I have been staying home by myself on Tuesday nights so that when Pastor Alec comes with a few of the others to do the on-stream prayer meeting, I've been by myself in my house, which I have to tell you has been a gift from the Lord. I find that as a worshiper, I'm a very audible worshiper. I know some of you, when you worship, All that shows is maybe you tap your toe on a fast song. For me, I I need to be expressing it and I need it to be audible. I need to be able to say it out loud when I pray. It's not the same when I just kind of pray to myself. It's when I get it out there that it seems to be more effective, both for, for the building up of my spirit and my heart, but just even kind of feeling like I connect with God. And I came uh, into last Tuesday night's prayer meeting, and I, I, I was praying. I felt the presence of the Lord in our home, just myself, just me. In my home, I felt his presence, and Pastor Ellick had identified ways that the enemy might have a strategy against us through, through all of this, but just, you know, generally, he's not a very nice guy, and he's after us, to, the Bible says, to kill us and to destroy us. And, and I remember when Pastor Bill Coleman got up, because his assignment was to pray against any, any, any lethargy, any acquiescence, any apathy that the enemy might be strategizing in our hearts. And I thought, oh, God, that's me. And, Lord, I have a choice. I, I can just let it grow or I can fight back. And in his mercy... <laughs> I determined, no, I'm going to fight. And I, I had to confess, I had to apologize to the Lord for allowing that attitude to even settle on my heart and in my spirit. And then I said to him, Lord, what can I do? 
what, what's a tangible thing I can do within these four walls because that's pretty much what I've got right now. What can I do to fight back? Well, Pastor Alec uh, had already prepared his sermon for this week and he had asked me earlier if I wanted to preach for Mother's Day, had, did the Lord, had the Lord said anything to me in particular that was burning in my heart? And I said, no, not really, which is completely honest answer to him. On Friday morning, he left the house and went golfing with one of the guys from Westgate. And I was home by myself. I cleaned up the breakfast dishes. I sat down in my little living room area where I keep my Bible and my glasses and I began I said Lord here I am it's just me and you again yay <laughs> thank you for this space and this time thank you for the sunshine that's pouring into my heart and into my life and then I opened the word having asked the Holy Spirit to just kind of speak to me as he would um, I I frequently ask him just convict what needs to be convicted um, encourage areas that that need to be encouraged just just talk to me out of your word and so I I read typically um, every day one chapter out of the history books one chapter out of the poets one chapter out of the prophets one out of the gospels and one out of then the epistles and my reading for Friday morning was in the book of Exodus. I, of course, in Exodus, I'm, I, I was ready to read, preparing to read Exodus 14, but very much in my heart and my memory, remembering that the children of Israel had been slaves in Egypt for a very long time. And the, the, very, the very burden of their slavery, their, their labor assignments were so hard and so overbearing that the Bible says they started to cry out to God and that God heard their cries and he heard their groans. And he decided, I love this verse, you can go, go look for it. He decided it's time for me to act. So God... Um, finds Moses out tending sheep, says, you and Aaron will go, I'll go with you, and here's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to just read this quickly with you. The Lord says, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. I will bring you into the land I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as your very own possession. I am the Lord. So Moses goes and approach, go back to Egypt approaches Pharaoh and said, we want to go worship. Let us go out into the wilderness and worship. And Pharaoh says, no way, Jose. Not going to happen. Uh, get over it. And after a, a number of times back into um, the throne room of Pharaoh, Moses finally says, you know, God says, if you don't let us go, he's going to send some devastating plagues. And we, we, we all know those. There were 10 of them. Uh, I, like many of you, probably watched Pastor Symbolist's message from, I believe, last week when he spoke on the ninth plague where the darkness came over the land of Egypt, not over Israel, or the people of Israel, but over Egypt. And it was a darkness that could be felt. And then the he still, he still wouldn't let them go. And God finally said, all right, I'm going to demand, I'm going to take life. And, and I'm going to take the lives of your eldest sons. 
And you would have thought that Pharaoh would have said, whoa, 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 okay, 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 you can go. But every time he kind of felt like he was going to, then he would recant. And he would say, no, no, I'm not going to let you go. Um, let's face it, you're holding up our whole economy. You're our labor force. Why would I let you go? Why would I set you free? And finally, the Lord takes the eldest sons of all of those in Egypt. He had instructed the Israelites to put the blood on the, the lintel, the sides of their doors, and that he would, when he saw that blood, he would pass over. So there was great distress, great crying out in the land of Egypt because every firstborn son was taken. And then Numbers 33 says, they, that is the children of Israel, under the leadership of Moses, set out from the city of Ramses in early spring on the 15th day of the first month, on the morning after the first Passover celebration, the people of Israel left defiantly in full view of all the Egyptians. Meanwhile, the Egyptians were burying all their firstborn sons whom the Lord had killed the night before. So now what I would love for you to do is for you to get your Bible. Yep, that one that is sitting there on your table next to the chair where you have your devotions. And that you would turn it to Exodus 14 because I want to pick that story up. It's interesting to me that as they left Egypt, it says that God led them by the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire on a roundabout route through the wilderness, not the shortest route, but a roundabout route because he, he knew that they would run into enemy um, uh, peoples and would have to battle and yeah. they'd been slaves for, for, for hundreds of years. They weren't ready to battle. So God in his mercy took them on this kind of route around to avoid the battles. And then if you've got your Bible, turn to Exodus 14 and we'll pick up the story. I'm going to read it, but I want to just comment as we read it because that's what happened to me Friday morning. As I was reading this, it was like these thoughts began to come to me because there was such a beautiful parallel that God was trying to show me between where we are today, where I am today, and what these people had gone through as your people, the Israelites. So Exodus 14, verse 1. Then, so God has led them out. Then the Lord gave these instructions to Moses. Order the Israelites to turn back and camp by Pihahirut between Migdal and the sea. Camp there along the shore across from Baal Zephon. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait, we've just come, we've just come out of there. Why would we now turn around and go back? It seemed very confusing. But there are times in my life when I feel like the Lord gives me direction. It's like, wait, God, that doesn't make sense. Fortunately, they, they, they listened to God because God continued by saying, then Pharaoh will think, the Israelites are confused. They're trapped in the wilderness. And once again, I, the Lord, will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after you. I have planned this. I love that. I have planned this in order to, one, display my glory through Pharaoh and his whole army. And after this, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites camped there as they were told. Even though it seemed like a confusing plan, they obeyed the Lord and camped there. And it's so gracious of the Lord to let us know that he's planned. Yeah. He's planned this. Every step of my life is ordered by him. He's got a plan and he had a purpose. 
And in this instance, which is pretty amazing, he was going to display his glory through the enemy. And he wanted that enemy to see and to know that he was the Lord. So let's continue reading. So the Israelites camped there as they were told. Now, it seems to me that if they're getting ready to camp, it's probably mid to late afternoon. Now, just imagine in your heart and in your mind a million people getting camps ready. Moms scurrying around trying to make sure their kids are close, getting, thinking about food for supper, um, setting up all the lean-tos and the pallets that need to be laid out. So let's just, let's just kind of in our imagination think this is late afternoon. Go to verse 5. When word reached the king of Egypt that the Israelites had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds. Surprise. What have we done letting all these Israelite slaves get away, they ask. So Pharaoh harnessed his chariot and called his troops. He took with him 600 of Egypt's best chariots, along with the rest of the chariots of Egypt, Each with its commander, the Lord had hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So he chased after the people of Israel who had had left Egypt, get this, with fists raised in defiance. I don't know that I ever have made note of that before. Now, I do remember that the Lord had given the people of Israel the instruction that they were to ask the Egyptians for anything they wanted that they had that the Egyptians would be at that place having just lost their sons, they would be ready to give them whatever they wanted. So I can just imagine them having left Egypt with their fists raised in defiance and those fists being covered with the bracelets and the jewelry that they'd gotten from the Egyptians. So you know that had to gall Pharaoh and all of Egypt. So he chased after Israel. The Egyptians chased after them, this is verse 9, with all the forces in Pharaoh's army, all his horses and chariots, his charioteers and his troops. The Egyptians caught up with the people of Israel as they were camped beside the shore near Piharehut and from across from Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked. Everywhere they looked, it says they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. Everywhere they looked on the horizon, they saw enemy. And there wasn't anywhere to go because they were now camped right against the sea. So they had the enemy in the horizon and they had the sea blocking them. And they cried out to the Lord and said to Moses in verse 11, Why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. And then we all have to say, really? But you've got to understand their, their mindset was the mindset of a slave. Their mind, there wasn't any bravery or courage there because you don't, you don't have to worry about that as a slave. You just do what the ruler tells you. But how many times haven't we panicked in the face of the enemy's presence? Everywhere we look, it looks like he's on an assault and he's coming against us and there are obstacles and we don't know what to do. And so we end up blaming God or we blame people and we say, what have you done to me? What have you done to me? It was easier back there in slavery. 
At least I knew what was expected of me. It was easier back there. (laughs) But then, bless his heart, then Moses, this very patient leader, says to them, this is verse 13, don't be afraid, just stand still. What? (laughs) Just stand still? Are you serious? The enemies everywhere we look. They're overwhelming, overcoming us. What? Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. (laughs) I think, oh my, oh my. God, surround us with people who will speak those kind of words of faith and courage and confidence in God. Moses had heard God's word, that word of promise. And he decided that he was going to believe that God would do what he said. If God promised he was going to take him into the promised land, he would do it. If he said, I'm going to rescue you from your enemy... He would do it. He decided to believe God. A million people. Just think, even after Moses' words, I doubt that things changed. I doubt that the words they were saying were all of a sudden upbeat and happy and yay, God. I doubt that. That There are a million people panicking, murmuring. Mothers worried about their children. Then the Lord said to Moses, this is verse 15, why are you crying out to me? And I, I had to stop right there and say, but Lord, you tell us to call on your name. You tell us to cry out to you. You tell us that if we draw near to you, you'll draw near to us. Why would you say to them, why are you crying out? I think it was because the things they said the reflections of what were in their hearts weren't so much calling out in faith on a God who was going to be their defender and their provider and their security, but it wasn't from a place of whining. They were, I mean, this, and God said, enough already, enough, enough. And then he tells them something very critical. He says to Moses, Tell the people, get moving. <laughs> get moving. Move it. Quit, quit crying. Quit, quit murmuring. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. Quit, quit having this major pity party. Get moving. And I was so impressed by the things that God actually even said to Moses. Now, Moses, obviously, was the leader. He was the one that led them out. He was the one that had confronted Pharaoh. He was the one that in the desert, the Lord, um, when the Lord called him, Moses said, oh, Lord, not me. I can't even even talk. I stutter. I'm, I'm not great orator and God said don't worry I'll send Aaron yeah but how are they going to know that it's really you with me and God says see that that shepherd's crook you're you're using um throw it down and when he threw it down it turned to a snake and God said I'm with you now the reason I remind you of that is that God says to Moses pick up your staff So you've got to get the people moving. So as the leader, and I would would say as any of us that have a place of influence over others in the name of Jesus. So that would be mothers as you influence your children. That would be fathers. That would be single people that have influence over over nieces and nephews, over work associates. It's going to be all of us that know Jesus because we're now we're now priests. We're priests. Yeah. We have authority. And and God had to say to Moses, "Pick up your staff." 
it makes you wonder where was it? Was it was it laying down somewhere? Was it on a on on a cart back behind? It was like find your staff and pick it up. It represents the anointing and the authority that God has given you. And every one of us must realize God has given us his anointing and his authority. And then he says to Moses, because it wasn't just enough to, to get find it, you know, find that staff. Now he says to him, raise your hand over the sea. Raise it up high. Raise it so everybody can see it. Raise it up. And then thirdly, divide the waters so that the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. I'm going to do miraculous things, but you've got to have your staff in hand and you've got to be ready to raise it up. And you see, I think for me, on Tuesday night, the Lord reminded me that maybe I, I didn't even know where my staff was. I had to go find my staff. And then in, in prayer and in worship and then in my little home, declaring over my home and over my neighborhood the, the purposes of God. In that place, God reminded me, pick up your staff. Raise your hand over that sea and divide the waters so that the Israelites, the people of God, can walk through. Moses had to show them the path to walk. That's what you and I have to do as well. There are times when we have to show the ones we love. Maybe somebody new to the Lord. We got to show, maybe it's somebody who's known the Lord for years but has wandered off. And we got to show them the path that God has created. Verse 17, God promises, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. I, I will harden their hearts again, and they're going to charge in after you. My great glory. I think that's such a wonderful phrase. And verse 17, my great glory will be displayed through Pharaoh, the enemy, through his, tri- his troops, his chariots, and his charioteers. When my glory is displayed through them, all of Egypt will see my glory and know that I am the Lord. Well, that was what he told them was his plan all along. Remember earlier in the chapter, God said that. He said, there, I want to I wanna show them my glory and I want them to know that I am God. Verse 15, then the angel of God who had been leading the people of Israel moved to the rear of the camp. So just imagine, here, here are these, these million people that Moses has said, get up, get moving. And the angel of God, who had been leading the people, moved to the rear of the camp. And the pillar of the cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them. The cloud settled between the Egyptian and Israelite camps. As darkness fell. So remember, this started like mid-afternoon when they were setting camp. And then all of a sudden they see the enemy on the horizon. And Moses said, get up, we're going to move. And now it says, as darkness fell, the cloud turned to fire and lit up the sky. 
But the Egyptians and the Israelites didn't approach each other all night. Well, no, I don't imagine that even the Egyptians, as arrogant as they were, I mean, after all, they were probably the, one of the greatest human cultures. As great as they were, they were not dumb enough to go against that wall of fire. But the thing I wanted to remember as well is that, because I remember, I remember times when it was really dark. And in the dark, what happens? Our fears are amplified. Our what ifs are amplified. The unknown seems just frightening and creepy. I've had those times. And in the mercy of God, here were the people of Israel, the enemy coming against them, the sea now as they've turned is in front of them, and God doesn't leave them in the dark. (laughs) I love that. Because this same light that held the Egyptians back lit up the night for the Israelis. God, God lighted up the night. Verse 21, then, there are lots of thens in this whole passage. Moses raised his hand over the sea and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. Now you've got to get this. This had to be some east wind, some strong wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seedbed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground, while walls of water were held up on each side by the east wind. Figure that out. This wind is so strong that, that walls of water are held back for a million people to walk through on a dry seedbed, and yet that east wind didn't hurt them at all, didn't hinder them at all. Didn't he, I, I don't know, maybe like the Hebrew children that came out of the fiery furnace and didn't even smell like the fire. Maybe their, their hair didn't even blow in all this wind. They were marching through on the path of, that God had provided. Verse 23, then the Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and charioteers chased them, that is the Israelites, into the middle of the sea. But just before dawn, the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army from the pillar of fire and the cloud. I think that's a very interesting thing to note. God was very present in all of this. God was not removed. He was not way off somewhere in a heavenly realm And things had just been set in motion. He was right there. And from the pillar of fire and cloud, God threw the Egyptian forces into total confusion. I love it. Total confusion. All of a sudden, it says he twisted their chariot wheels, making their chariots difficult to drive. Until they said, let's get out of here. Away from these Israelites, the Egyptians shouted. The Lord is fighting for them against the Egyptians. Lord, throw that enemy into confusion. Throw him into confusion. Every strategy brought down. Every strategy, and they, they pan, the Egyptians panicked. They said, let's get out of here. Obviously, somebody else is fighting with them and for them than just what we can even see. When all the Israelites had reached the other side, verse 26, all the Israelites, everybody was across, the Lord said to Moses, raise your hand over the sea again, then the waters will rush back and cover the Egyptians 
and their chariots and their charioteers. So as the sun began to rise, Moses raised his hand over the sea and the waters rushed back into its usual place. The Egyptians tried to escape, but the Lord swept them into the sea. And I, I, you know, I just, was that the wind? Did the wind just sweep them in? Or as the waters returned, it says in the next verse, did the water sweep them in? God swept them into the sea, covering all the chariots and charioteers, the entire army of Pharaoh. Of all the Egyptians who had chased the Israelites into the sea, not a single one of them survived. Remember what Moses had told them? The enemy you see today, you will never see again. God took care of every one of them. Not a one of the enemy survived. Verse 29, but the people of Israel had walked through the middle of the sea On dry ground as the water stood up like a wall on both sides. That's how the Lord rescued Israel from the hand of the Egyptians that day. It, It wasn't the only time the Lord rescued them. It wasn't the only time he fought the battle for them. But that's how he did it that day. And the Israelites saw the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the seashore, which I think is an interesting detail because God could have just, with these strong waters, just washed over them. But for the Israelites to be able to actually see the evidence of the miraculous intervention of God was an important thing because then it says in verse 31, When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. I think in so many ways, we feel surrounded by the enemy. We feel like he's breathing down our necks. We feel actually like we're enslaved, that we're being ruled. We don't have the freedom that we're used to having. We feel that pressure and there doesn't seem to be a way out because there there are obstacles. There are things like the sea that seem to be in our way. But like what the Lord said to me last Tuesday night, I'm saying to you today, and I really don't care who you are or who you think you are, It is time for you to find your staff, pick it up, raise it up, raise it up high and divide the waters and show the path for people to walk through and find Jesus. When I finished with my reading on Friday, which I have to tell you, every Every verse, I had to just stop, and I was so stirred by the presence of God and by his commitment to his people, and that he hasn't changed, and his commitment to me and to us has not changed. God is fighting for us. He will win the battle. Yes, he The victory is the Lord's. But I had to then, I felt so, so constrained to go into prayer. And one of the first things I prayed was, oh God, reveal your great glory to us, to our world. Reveal your great glory. Glory that will be seen. Glory is seen. Lord, we need a great rescue. Only you can bring that great rescue. We feel like the enemy's backed us in. We have insurmountable, insurmountable obstacles that somehow they prevent your promises from being fulfilled. Lord, we're tempted to acquiesce. We're tempted to give up. 
We're tempted to let go of the spiritual authority that you've given us as believers in Jesus. Our personal God-given rights to live free, no longer enslaved. We just are tempted to just accept things the way they are. To give up on desiring even to gather together. That seems to be in somebody else's decision box. We we can't even decide that ourselves. Lord, I'm not going to give up on that. I'm going to ask you that we could come together to freely worship you in in your sanctuary. Lord, reveal the foolishness of man. Just like he did with over Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Reveal the foolishness of men. There's a a verse in Job chapter 5 that says, God traps the wise in their own cleverness. God, I pray that. I pray that. Entrap the enemy in his own cleverness. It doesn't matter about what his perceived power is or his perceived authority or intellect. Compared to God's infinite wisdom, it's just foolishness. Lord, please, please overthrow those who rise up against you and against your people. Rise up, overthrow those who rise up against you. That we may be able to, again, raise a loud shout of praise together as your people before you, our God. Scripture says that on the other side of the sea, having seen the mighty power the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, and they were so filled with awe that Moses led them in a song. (laughs) <laughs> will you recite that song with me I wish we could all sing it together maybe some of you in your homes you can make up a melody as we, we read the, the verses or the lyrics of Moses song will be on your screen I'm going to ask those few of us that are in the sanctuary to read it with me And to be reminded as we sing that we are declaring his goodness. We, as we sing, we're declaring his faithfulness. As we sing, even our worship, even our worship is spiritual warfare this morning. So we're going to read parts of the song of Moses, Exodus 15, you'll see it on your screen. Please read it out loud with me. Join me and let it be audible as you consider God's faithfulness and his goodness. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He has hurled both horse and rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and army he has hurled into the sea. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, smashes the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow those who rise against you. At the blast of your breath, the waters piled up. The enemy boasted, I will chase them and catch up with them. I will plunder them and consume them. I will flash my sword. My powerful hand will destroy them. But you blew with your breath 
and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you among the gods, O oh Lord, glorious in holiness, awesome in splendor, performing great wonders. You raised your right hand. The earth swallowed our enemies. With your unfailing love, you lead the people you... In your might, you guide them to your sacred home. Find that staff, raise that staff, and remember, God is fighting for you. He is with you. We stand in victory in Jesus. Yes.